Okay. Well, let's jump in. So I have a pretty short study tonight, and then I had some questions at the end that we can uh, answer and interact. They're not hard. It's okay. I saw that face, Leah. It's okay. Easy question. Okay. So here we go. Tonight we're going to jump in. We're going to be in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 16. All right. So let's go. Let's go. All right. So then Jesus gave this illustration. Imagine what would happen if you were to go to one of your friends in the middle of the night, pound on his door and shout, please, do you have some food you can spare? And some translators say, can I have three loaves of bread? Now, just keep in mind, this is the middle of the night, all right? <laughs> and it says in verse 6, it says, A friend just arrived at my house unexpectedly, and I have nothing to serve him. But your friend says, why are you bothering me? <laughs> the door is locked, and my family and I are all in bed. You expect me to get up and give you our food? Question mark. <laughs> verse 8, I tell you because of your shameless persistence. Even though it's the middle of the night, your friend will get up out of be his bed and give you all that you need. I think that's really neat. Um, like I said, just this is very self-explanatory, but I do want to touch a few things in here. All right, so I read uh, basically 5 through 7, so let's talk a little bit about these verses. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is they were friends, okay? There was a relationship there. They were friends, all right? And so you go to... Basically, you have a friend that comes over to your house in the middle of the night, and then you go to your friend's house in the middle of the night, try to get something for the friend who showed up at your door and expect me at the middle of the night. <laughs> Talk about bad timing. <laughs> Just kind of laugh. But see, I think Jesus is, is making a point here that, you know, midnight, that's, that's really about the most inconvenient time possible for somebody to show up and have a and have a need for you, and for you to show up and need something from somebody else sitting at midnight, that's that's pretty much the most inopportune time it could be for this to happen. So that's significant. Is even though all of your friends, this is this is a stretch in the relationship <laughs> between all of you, all right? But so you knock on that door, and like I said, I'm just going to lightly touch it because it's really really self-explanatory, but you're knocking on the door, and your friend's like, hey, man, why are you bothering me? I'm in the bed. We're comfortable. Uh, I think it's kind of neat, too, that, um, you know, whenever times are going really well and, and everything's going great, it's easy to give, isn't it? But when, you're, when, it's, when it's difficult, it's uncomfortable, and that's what he's showing here is, hey, we're, I'm in the bed. I'm very comfortable. I'm cozy. And you expect me to get up, get uncomfortable, and give to you. Isn't that interesting? And the door's locked, okay? But here you go. Verse 8 is really the key to this thing. This is what Jesus is conveying. Because of your shameless persistence. Uh, they didn't knock on the door one time. They didn't knock on the door twice. They didn't knock on the door three times. They knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked until it became more uncomfortable to stay in the bed <laughs> than it was to come to the door. You with me? <laughs> Isn't that neat? You know, I kind of have to laugh at this. But that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying because of your shameless persistence, even though it's the middle of the night, even though it's an inconvenient time for everybody involved, even because it's the most inconvenient time, your persistence is going to cause your need to get met. And he's teaching on prayer here, so we're going to keep going, okay? I know I just lightly touched this, but it's going to really expand some more in these next few verses. Verse 9 and 10. So it is with your prayers. All right? Ask, and you'll receive. Seek, and you'll discover. Knock on heaven's door, and it will one day open for you. Every persistent, like he said, the preacher, a shamelessly persistent person will receive what he asked for or what she asked for. Every persistent seeker will discover what he needs. And everyone who knocks persistently will one day find an open door. And you see, I underlined some different things in here. And I kind of, I did that for a reason. Um, ask, seek, and knock. 
you know, everyone, all of those are part of prayer, but there, there's a little bit of difference between them, between these things. Ask is simply praying. You're just asking for it, okay? Seeking is, a, is deeper. Seeking is more, more involved. In other words, I have to find this thing. You with me? So in your prayers, you're looking for the answer. You're looking for the provision. You're looking for God's best. So you ask is just, you know, it's like I got a little list. Hey, I need this. Then whenever you don't get that right away, you trans, you go to the next level of seeking. Like God, <laughs> where are you in this? Help! I need something out of here. And then you start knocking. And you, how many of you have ever been to somebody's house and said, <laughs> "When you knock, it's always plural, isn't it?" <laughs> so it's, it's neat because you start out. You ask. You have your request. Then. Uh, that didn't get it. <laughs> so now you're seeking. You're like, God, I'm listening. What have you got? Am I off? What's happening here? Uh, how many times have you been praying for something and over the course of time your prayer changed? Uh-huh. Everybody in here would say amen to that one. And see, that's the thing about what happens. Is you, initially, we all ask for something. But then whenever we don't get the answer, we start seeking. And are they, and seeking really, uh, let me let me back up just a touch here. Prayer in the Bible, prayer actually means an exchange of wishes. That is a literal Greek meaning of prayer. And even in the Hebrew, before that, it means an exchange of wishes. It's not a one-way street. It isn't us just us showing up with our daddy do list and unloading. <laughs> but it ain't that. What is it? It's we we pray. In other words, we there. The first part of exchange is we ask, unless God initiates it. Sometimes He'll initiate it. But we ask, and that's us sharing our wish and our desire. But then we move into the seeking thing when we don't get the answer right. We start seeking, and that's when we start listening for him. What's your best for me? Am I off, God? Should I be praying differently? And so our prayer, it starts going around a curve in the seeking stage a lot of times, doesn't it? It starts changing because the Holy Spirit starts revealing to us where he's at, what he's doing, how we should be praying. So our prayers will change a lot of times after that initial asking thing as the exchange and the dialogue starts happening. And I'm talking about whether God speaks to your thoughts or not, you'll notice that your desires will start changing. See, God speaks to us a lot of ways, and I'm not going to get into all that right here, but he'll speak in our thought life. He'll actually speak in a, through an adjustment of desires. You know, Holy Spirit's big in that one, because while you're praying, all of a sudden you think, well, you know, that's not really what I wanted anyway. That's good. <laughs> that's the Holy Spirit right there, you know, adjusting the desire to line up with his will. Isn't that neat? And the Bible says that when we pray anything according to his will, he hears us, and we have what we ask for. So a lot of times we've got to go around the curve a little bit in the seeking process to get better in his will so we can get our answer. All right. And then knock. Man, I mean, be bloody knuckled if you have to. <laughs> Don't give up. But I think it's neat because the progression Jesus shares here is beautiful. Ask, give your request, then start seeking, start adjusting. You know, look for God in it. Find that exchange. And then knock on heaven's door. And look at this. And it will one day, I like that, one day open for you. I wish it'd be today. <laughs> but, but sometimes it ain't. Sometimes it's, you know, next week, next month. Sometimes it's years. You know, like I shared on Sunday, you know, we have to have that longevity thing. If I don't get it, my children will get it. If they don't get it, their grandkids will get it. Remember, I talked about the, that for, on Sunday. That, that was the mentality uh, in the Vietnam War. And that's why they're like, you Americans won't last that long. <laughs> you guys have to get back home. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Started to share something from when I was serving over in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, but I won't. It's probably not really the most appropriate thing for right here. But I just had an interaction with a Saudi MP, and, uh, and he asked me a question. And so, um, okay, I can, I, can, I can dilute part of it. He asked me a question. He said, he said what do you do? You catch Saddam. What you do, you catch Saddam. And I said, well, I said, uh, simple. I said, I'd do away with him right now and be on the first plane back to the States. He said, oh, you Americans, too fast. You're too fast. I torture him long time. <laughs> I make him suffer days and days. I said, yeah, and I'll be sleeping in my bed with my lovely wife having good meals while you're doing that. Go for it. And he said, oh, you Americans, everything's so quick.
I had some some fun interactions with those guys. Yeah, but isn't that the truth, though? You know, part of our culture is, um, I don't know about you, but I want it yesterday. <laughs> and doesn't that roll into our prayer life? Doesn't it? We pray, and then God don't give it to us that day, and we're, we're almost offended. <laughs> And boy, by the end of the week, during it, seven days, God, that's I was generous, God. <laughs> but isn't that the way we are? But then it rolls into months. And sometimes we get weary. You know, the Bible says don't get weary in well-doing. You know, prayer is also part of well-doing. Don't get weary in your prayer time because in due season you'll reap if you don't give up. So anyway, I just want to touch that. Is some of some of the things that that cause it a little hard, be harder, a little harder for American Christians is because we've been comfortable and we're we're a little we're a little more impatient than a lot of people. I mean, a lot of other cultures, man, for them to pray a year about nothing's no big deal. They're used to not getting what they want. <laughs> yeah, Amen. So that's why God stretches that a little bit so He can train us to be used to not getting everything right then too. All right. But I like this. Let's go right in here. Every persistent person will receive what he asked for. All right. But you can see the process of transformation into the will of God right here. And through the persistence, you'll get the will of God. You'll get what you asked for because all of that has been adjusted over time. Um, but And every persistent seeker will discover, I like it, will discover what he needs. You see that? See, there's a difference between wants and needs. And that's the thing, the persistent, the, the staying at it for a long period of time, you'll discover what you really need, what was really stirred in you, what was pushing that prayer, even though initially it wasn't what was coming out of your mouth or maybe stirring in your mind. But over time, you'll adjust your desires to be his, and then you'll really discover what you need, and God will give it to you. And everyone who knocks persistently will one day find, and look here, I've got Ann underlined, an open door. One day you're going to find an open door. It might not be the one you were looking for to start with, but you'll find the right one. <laughs> Praise God. That's fun. All right, so let's keep going. And just so you know, I'm going to be speaking on prayer this Sunday too, but it's going to be a much de bigger, different, little different message, okay? I will touch on persistence, but it's going to be a little different. When I was studying this, man, I just felt the Holy Spirit stirring. Yeah, we need to hit prayer again in the church. We need to just talk about it. So this Sunday we're going to look at it one again. Uh, Verse 11, Jesus says, let me ask you this. Do you know of any father who would give his son a snake on a plate uh, when he asked for a servant of fish? Of course not. Do you know of any father who would give his daughter a spider, and many of them say a scorpion, when she asked for an egg? Of course not. But see, I like this. Jesus is, you know, he takes it from the, 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 the ch child of God prayer relationship and he takes it and makes it bigger and more touchable for them to understand better, you know? Isn't it neat? God, he'll teach spiritual truths. Jesus teaches spiritual truths. The scripture's full of deep spiritual things. But a lot of times there'll be a, just like a very practical, day-to-day -day nuts and bolts parable or picture or some explanation that we can actually touch a little more, you know, we touch a little more fully. And that connects with the spiritual truth. And that's what he's doing here. All right? So... Whenever he says right here, he says in verse 13, if imperfect parents, I like that part of the translation because God is the perfect parent. Father is the perfect father. Jesus is the perfect Lord and brother and Holy Spirit. Oh, my gosh. Most caring human being in the there is. But every all three of them are absolutely flawlessly perfect in their parenting of us, aren't they? They're perfect. And so Jesus, says, if imperfect parents know how to lovingly take care of their children and give them, and I, you see, I, I italicized and made them a little bigger, and give them what they need. See, we're, we're staying in this need thing. How much more will the perfect Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit's fullness when his children ask him? And to, to me, you know, years for years, I thought this was kind of strange. I was like, all right, we're talking about food, we're talking about provision, we're talking about things we need, and Jesus takes all of that and boils it down and says, oh, um, you're actually going to get the Holy Spirit out of this. Has that, has that ever stirred you that Jesus says, Father's going to give you the Holy Spirit. He talks all this thing about praying. You're going to get your needs. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. You're going to get the other. But then Jesus ties up says, uh, oh, and by the way, uh, Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Doesn't it seem a little strange that he went out of this, you know, getting needs met and, and food and all these other things into Father's going to give you the Holy Spirit. 
That just seemed like he was like, okay. For years I wondered about that. But I want you to think about the fact, we, I talk about this a lot, and we talk about it at the Gateway a lot, the, the, uh, the partnership that we have with God. We're in a partnership with everything. Our prayers are a partnership. Our, 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 our decisions are a partnership. Everything we've got has to be a partnership with us and God. And so I think it's neat because he says, let me read this one more time. How much more at the bottom here will the perfect Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit's fullness when his children ask him? Do you know what, you know what happens when we pray and God comes through? Every time we pray and God comes through, what he does is, is he causes the Holy Spirit to fill a new spot in our life. Every time he answers one of our prayers, it's the Holy Spirit coming upon us, coming in us, filling a new spot in us. And that's how our need gets met. You know, because we can't take care of ourselves. We can't meet our own needs. So Holy Spirit is the, the, the chosen person to do that. Isn't that neat? So when we pray, we're like, God, I need that job. Or I need that thing. God, God. We pray, and we're like, nothing happens. Then we start seeking, oh, God, <laughs> help. And we start seeking, and then we start knocking. And then when the answer comes, guess what? Right when through that process, we get more full of the Holy Spirit. We get God's provision in our life in that spot. But it's, it's always God because he meets our needs. So I think it's neat that when your prayer gets answered, guess what? You got more of the Holy Ghost in that place, and that's how you got your needs met. So that's pretty cool. That stumped me for a long time. I was like, God, they're asking for food. Why are you giving the Holy Spirit? I mean, that's great. We like the Holy Spirit, but why? When I was young, I was like, Lord, what's going on here? But I come to realize that everything's relational. You know, as a child of God, everything is relational. Everything is through relationship with God and with the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Everything is. Mm -hmm. If the Holy Spirit ain't on the scene, uh, you ain't getting whatever you need met. <laughs> All right. So in verse 14, now he's going to kind of transition here. It says, one day a crowd gathered around Jesus, and among them was a man who was mute. All right. Uh, so this crowd had this person who could not speak. It says, Jesus drove out of the man the spirit that made him unable to speak. When the demon left him, the man's tongue was loosed, and immediately he was able to speak. So I, I just gonna, I'm going to touch something on a, uh, just a specific note uh, connected with this. Is, um, um, some sicknesses and diseases and problems are caused by, the, by demons. Some of them are. All of them are not. Okay. There are some people that attribute everything to demonic stuff and this, that, and the other. Guys, we live in a fallen world. You know, the, cre the creation longs for the redemption. You know, things are wearing out. Our bodies are wearing out. <laughs> you know, stuff happens. You know, so some things are demonic, some things are not. But I think it's interesting, this guy couldn't speak at all, and as soon as this demon left, he could speak. Um, really interesting. And so let's talk about this. The stunned crowd saw it and all, saw it all and marveled in amazement over this miracle. That's a miracle when somebody can't speak and then they can. And I think he was deaf too, according to Matthew. I think the Bible says in Matthew that he was deaf and mute. He couldn't hear or speak. I may be off, but I think I'm right in that with the, the same instance in Matthew. Um, but I want to kind of uh, talk about this just a little bit here because. Here we're going to see some stuff. In Matthew, this is the, the next thing that happened. Right here, where it said, this part here, the stunned crowd saw it all, marvel and amazement over the miracle. Here in Matthew, it gives the detail of their amazement, their marvel and amazement. It says, all the people wondered in amazement and said, could this be the son of David, the Messiah? You see that? He, Jesus performed a miracle. This, 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 uh, I think this deaf and mute man, he could hear and speak. And... Uh, and then the people were like, could this be our Messiah? Could this be the one we've been waiting on? Isn't that great? But we're going to see some more. I want to read this, and then we're going to talk about this, because you've actually got three groups of people here, three different groups pictured here. And it's very much uh, like the groups we have today to some extent. All right. It says, but there were some in the crowd, here we go, who protested. In Matthew, it says it was the Pharisees. It says, saying, he cast out demons by the power of Satan, the demon king. And some, some translations have Beelzebul, which is the prince of demons. All right. Um, it says, others were skeptical and tried to persuade Jesus to perform a spectacular display of power to prove he was the Messiah. What did he just do? 
Apparently they missed that one. A deaf mute guy got got delivered from the from the enemy and was talking and you know he was excited and uh, but that didn't quite get it for him. Man, it's ridiculous. But anyway, let's keep going. So what I want to talk about is these three groups of people we see here. I should have underlined this, but we see right here the first group, and I'm going to use the verse in Matthew to describe this. The first group says all the people wondered in amazement said, could this be the son of David? All right, and these, these are three groups, we, these three primary groups here. We see these groups in society. There are other subgroups and different things, but we see those looking for God. These people were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for God, weren't they? So they saw this thing happen, and they were, they, immediately their attention went, could this be our Messiah? They were looking for God in that moment. That's the first group. And there are people today that are inside churches and outside of churches who are seriously looking for God today. There's that first group. The next one we see, which is the Pharisees right here. But there were some in the crowd protesting saying he cast out demons by the power of Satan. <laughs> we see here those looking for the devil in everything. That's a group we have today. People looking for the devil and everything. You know what? It don't matter what happens. There's people who are mean, ornery, nasty, fighting, fussing, and looking for the devil everywhere. And like I had a friend of mine, a dear pastor friend in the mid-90s, who's my best friend, he told me, because I, I went into a long season of warfare. I was going to set my town free. And, I mean, I was, I was after it, man. Seriously, anointing every sign in the town. I was on it. And, uh, he told me, he said, Dana, he was such a, he was such a wise man. A guy. He said, Dana, he said, you know, he said, uh, he said, if you look for the devil, you'll always find him. He said, always. He said, and guess what? He said, when you see him here and you go over and look for him, he won't be there. And you'll say, wait, I'm over here. And then you run over there and you say, well, I'm over here. And what happens, you'll waste a bunch of your time and God's time running around looking for him. And he will distract you as long as you'll let him. Wise counsel, isn't it? Yeah, that was the begin, beginning of the end of me chasing the devil around. I'll deal with him, but I ain't going to chase him no more. But see, the thing is, there are people, that, the second group, there's people who are just looking for the devil. And then we see a last group right here. Others. See, we've got the three groups. Looking for God, looking for the devil, and others were skeptical. And tried to persuade Jesus to perform a spectacular display of power to prove that he was the Messiah. Third group. They're just looking for more proof. <sighs> Jesus, you know, God just needs to do something bigger. He ain't done enough. You know, he couldn't be real. He ain't done enough. I need to see something bigger, something better, something more spectacular. I just, you know, I'm right down the line. I'm just not quite convinced. I need some more evidence. But isn't that, I mean, we see those three groups in society today, don't we? Those looking for God, those looking for the devil, and those who just need more proof of something. They're skeptics. But I thought that was neat. All three of these groups are represented, and, even to, and this was you know 2,000 years ago. And even today, we've still got those three groups. <laughs> ah, it's, it's, it's amazing that we have those three groups. Um, but I wanted to kind of, one second here. Ah, and I want to talk about one last comment on this last group that I had in my notes that I didn't remember. Um, do you know, if anybody looks and focuses on what they don't have, they'll never have enough. Mm, that's good. You know that? If you're always saying, well, I just need more evidence, or I don't have quite enough here, or I need, it, or, I need some more money over there, or, I need this here, or, I need that there, they will live in a state of constant lack. And that, you know what that's called? That's a poverty spirit. Poverty spirit ain't just money. It's not having enough anywhere in your life. If, you, if you're always not quite there, that's a poverty spirit. Mm. So... Now I want to ask a few questions. We got about fifteen minutes, and I know that I know that we, you know, the people here are extremely sharp Christians. I mean, we're there, so yeah. So anyway, I, I might not ask this on Sunday, but tonight, you guys are awesome. I'm joking, but uh, let's talk about our prayer lives a little bit, okay? Let's just talk about our prayer lives a little bit. So. 
tell me just just let you know just each person be brief but just tell me give me a couple things a couple parts of your prayer life that are really good for you just things you do or ways you do certain things or a timing of something just something about your prayer life that that kind of stands out to you as being a highlight anybody want to share something music good so what kind of music with lyrics or, or instrumental? With lyrics. Cool. That's good, Leah. Thank you. Anybody else? Music. Peace. Peace. Yeah. Yeah. Peace of God. Isn't that wonderful? Love that. All right, Charles. I know you get up before anybody else in here does. You got to have something going on, brother. <laughs> Just the time, the quietness of the day of the two, uh, pray and to God and know he's there and speak to me and, mm. and it just stands out for the whole day. Wow. Amen. That's neat. Your time in the morning changes the whole day. Yeah, that's good. That's really good, Charles. I would think if I was to get up in the morning and not do that, I don't think I'd make it through the day. <laughs> You know what that says? That says that says relationship. That says intimacy right there, Charles. I, I I don't think I'd make it without that. Way to go, brother. Anybody else? I started something with my kids were young and I had mission that was really important to pray about. I prayed about it in the shower because nobody was gonna bug me when I put it in the shower. And I held that over where if it's really, really important or really, really bothering me. It makes the shower time prayer. And, um, <laughs> I like it. And it just seems to work for me and the Lord probably because there's, you know, it's just, it's actually a really sweet time because that water coming down and just like him, you know, and sharing. And I could, you know, if you want to spiritualize it, but it does make me feel that way. And, That's good. And so, yeah, all the really, really super important stuff get prayed, gets prayed over in the shower. That's cool. <laughs> I've never heard that, but I like it, all. Of. <laughs> Praise <laughs> God. <laughs> That's cool. I like that. That's wonderful. But another thing that that does too, and I'm just going to add this, is, you know, and I taught the men, I had the men, they had homework for a month. I said, hey, I said, when the Bible says to go into your prayer closet, it's referring to have a place, a place of prayer that becomes familiar. So when you go into that place, you automatically kind of shift more quickly into praying. You know what I'm saying? When you're praying in an unfamiliar place, Sometimes it may take you a minute to kind of get, get your mind engaged and get the cares off because you're not used to it. But like when you have a place you're familiar with, like the shower, when you have a place like when you step into the shower and you got something going on, you more quickly get into his presence, don't you, Alvin? Because you've trained yourself that, okay, this is a serious thing. When I get there, it's happening. <laughs> but isn't that good, though? And that's why I gave the men an assignment for the month. And I said, hey, guys. Uh, if you got a spot, I want to hear about it next month. But if you don't have a spot, please find a spot, just a spot that you can pray and kind of make it your prayer place. Just, you know, try that and see how it works. And so got a lot of good feedback from the guys. Some of the guys didn't have a spot, and they, they found one. And some of the other guys were telling me about their spot this last time. So, so praise God for that. Anybody else? Something about your prayer life. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing tonight, son, man. I appreciate it. But prayer is, uh, the thing about prayer is timing is important. You know, timing is important. Particularly the older you get. Uh, need to pray in the morning when all the brain cells are firing. And then you pray throughout the day. But come the evening when I'm tired, uh, you know, I can read but expecting to have a lot of, uh, of ongoing stuff in my head is probably not the best plan at night. <laughs> you know, I'll talk with God, but I'm not, you know, I don't really want to get into to really, you know, serious type of interaction. Even with God, I just kind of want to rest in him in the evenings because I'm tired and my brain ain't doing quite as well. When I was young, I could pull it off at night, but as I'm getting older, it's like, okay, morning time's the best through right after lunch is generally the best time for me. Um, you know, having a place to pray, like I just said, is important. Something I actually did for years, it, whenever I had um, specific things, I had a prayer list. How many of you have had a prayer list where you wrote things down? Yeah. 
I did that off and on for years when I had a lot of things like pressing or things going on. I just had a prayer list. And it wasn't to be a rigid religious structure. It was a reminder. So they would be included because there were times when I had like my list was full and there's no way I could remember that. So I had a prayer list. And sometimes that can be helpful if you're in a season with a lot going on as a reminder. That's, that's a big deal. Um, another thought is, um, is uh, what I used to do for years and years is I would always read my Bible first before I prayed. And it doesn't matter. You do it however. But with that, what it did is, you know, the Bible grounds you. You know, I've talked about it before, how the Bible, when you read it, it just grounds you and it stabilizes your life and it makes you feel solid. But also, um, the Bible will cause, literally, it'll pull you into that calm place with God, and then I would launch out of that in prayer. So I've tried it both ways, but now either way works for me. But sometimes whenever you've got a lot going on in your life and you have trouble praying, it can help to read the Word first to settle your spirit some before you pray. So that's just a, a thought and a suggestion. Um, yeah, and let's see. And one last thing on prayer, and then we'll close out, is... There are times when we pray kind of of our own free will, and there's other times when God puts a burden on you to pray. You know what I'm talking about. And that's an intercessor, like an intercessory burden. Um, what I found with that is uh, when God gives you a burden to pray for yourself or for other people, you have to pray until the burden's gone. You know what I'm talking about? And that's what you hear people say, I'm praying through something. Uh, in, it, in its actual proper use, that's what it means is you've got a burden and you're praying through that burden. And you're praying through that thing until the load's gone. And Jesus will give us those things for a season. I mean, sometimes it can be a brief time. Sometimes it can go on for a long time. But uh, intercessory prayer is different. I'm not going to talk about that today. But, but whenever you have a burden, that's different than just relational prayer. A burden's a different thing. I mean, you're actually, your emotions get involved and you're, you're really pressing for that breakthrough or for that thing for people. And so, but I, it's neat whenever you pray about it enough and you really get a hold of God's heart and pray through it, all of a sudden the burden's gone. It's just like, just like it came on all of a sudden, it's gone all of a sudden. That's really neat whenever that happens. But any last thoughts before we pray, guys? Uh, were you the passion yes, I was. Yep. Whatever. Right in here. Yes. Um, did they put any notes on why they put the a dollar? You know, he did Most not. Most revelations do not. They assume that it's another version of the sun. I didn't look and see if it was a gender neutral thing okay. with that. But believe it or not, when I read that, and please forgive me if you don't agree with this, I thought, cool. We got a, we got a, up here, we've got a son asking for, for some fish, and then we got a daughter asking for something. And to me, I was just kind of like, well, that's kind of nice that he did that. I didn't actually dig into the actual thing, whether the she was supposed to be a he or if it was gender neutral. And there are quite a few places in the scripture where they put he, but it's actually gender neutral. And I didn't look at this to confirm that. But I thought, I was like, okay, well, you know, the, the son asked for one thing and the daughter asked for something else. And I just kind of rolled with it. So, but, yeah, but I don't know for sure, Autumn, if it was supposed to be a, a, a boy. Yeah, I just never... Yeah, yeah, and he he really does a good job of doing the research and like cross referencing. I mean, he cross references the Aramaic, the Hebrew. He does like a lot of research with this with this Passion translation. So yeah, I don't know. I may glance in that because I, I I saw it too, and I'm like, huh. But I didn't dig into it. I just didn't dig into that specific thing. Okay, cool. Um, get back here to the end of the thing, and bam. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you for your word. God, thank you for teaching us to ask, Lord, and then to seek and look for you in it. And then, Lord, to keep on knocking and keep on knocking until the right door opens. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for partnering with us in our prayers. And, God, we love you so much. We really do. Thank you for another wonderful Wednesday service of being with you and being with each other. Help us the rest of the week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here.